The Swarthmore Historical Society obtained the slides and tapes of a presentation given by Dave Narberth, a longtime Swarthmore resident, in 1975 and shortened over two hours into what you will see and hear. Here are some interesting things about Swarthmore, found out in the course of the research, which will help put the historical narrative into perspective. The town is named after Swarthmore Hall, the home in England of George Fox, the founder of the Society of Friends. Dutch, Swedes, and English were the first three groups of settlers in Swarthmore after the Indians. The first houses built were on the hill between College Avenue and Ogden Avenue, between Cedar Lane and Northchester Road. Swarthmore does not have any streets, just avenues and roads, as reported in Ripley's Believe It or Not. The borough was incorporated in 1893 and has a drawing of Parish Hall on its seal. This map is dated from 1870 and it shows Springfield Township. The first record of Springfield as a township goes back to 1686. In 1681, William Penn sold 850 acres to Henry Maddock and James Kennerly. The deed is in the Friends Historical Library at Swarthmore College. The map shows a road laid out in 1691 between the Friends Meeting House in Marple and the Friends Meeting House in Chester. The remains of that road, as it is in Swarthmore, is known as Cedar Lane. In 1684, Mordecai Maddock owned 1,500 acres in the area which included all the present property of the college, including the Benjamin West House, which was built in 1724. At a later date, property which was farmland was owned by Mr. Ogden and Mr. Gibbons. This property included all of the land north of the railroad. This is the Benjamin West House as it appeared in the early days. The road came right through the middle of the college campus, which the college didn't like. They petitioned the West Hill Land Company in 1880 to have that road discontinued, moved to the east. The reason they had to petition the West Hill Land Company was that the land company owned all the surrounding land except the college campus. In 1882, the land was transferred from the West Hill Land Company, which was made up of early settlers and their wives, to the community. In order to have the real estate transaction legal, the women had to have a hand in the vote. The Benjamin West House, unfortunately, had a fire in 1873 and was rebuilt by the college to provide apartments for members of the faculty. Since it wasn't rebuilt to its original state, it could no longer be considered an historic building. However, it has been classified as an historic site. These next two scenes are of the Leeper House on Avondale Road. It was a summer home of Thomas Leeper, who was a prominent Revolutionary War patriot. He was born in 1745 at Strathaven, Lavark, Scotland, and he came to Philadelphia in 1765 to go into the tobacco exporting business. He amassed a fortune and became very active in the Revolution, supporting the effort financially as well as serving as a soldier in the battles of Trenton, Princeton, Brandywine, and Germantown. He was a founder and first officer of the Franklin Institute and was a personal friend of Thomas Jefferson, who visited this house along with other Revolutionary War notables. Jefferson presented the tobacco leaf freeze, which you will note over the door. The first record of Leaper's holdings in the area was the Leaper Snuff Mill in 1779. By 1790, he had expanded his holdings to 96 acres, including the quarry on Avondale Road. Prior to 1800, Leaper experimented with a railroad at the Bull Tavern at Second and Poplar in Philadelphia. In 1809, he built a railroad from the quarry down to the tidewater on the Ridley Creek, and he had cars with metal wheels that ran on wooden or stone tracks with cars pulled by horses. This went on for about 20 years. As the quarry business progressed, it was necessary to have something a little faster than something drawn by horses. He built a canal. In the middle 1800s, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad built a spur line from the Baldwin Locomotive Works in Eddystone up to the quarry. The B&O Railroad, which nobody ever thinks of as coming to Swarthmore, did, even though it went to Leaper's Quarry. 
This is a section of the first map which shows Springfield Road cutting through the college campus. And it wasn't until the borough of Swarthmore came into being that the name of the road was changed to Cedar Lane. The map shows the birthplace of Benjamin West. As the college slowly developed, it became necessary to build some houses to accommodate the people who worked there. The West Hill Land Company was formed to undertake this task. It consisted of Mr. and Mrs. James Simmons Kent, Mr. and Mrs. James Gasco, Mr. and Mrs. Sylvester Garrett, Mr. and Mrs. Richard T. Ogden, John W. Ogden, and Thomas Walter, who was the secretary. As we noted earlier, the first houses were built on the hill between College Avenue and Ogden Avenue, and between Cedar Lane and North Chester Road. In December 1882, at the request of the college, Chester Road was created. The first house built was not one of the original West Hill Land Company properties, but it was the president's house at Swarthmore College. The president of the college lived there until 1909. The original structure is part of the Sproul Observatory. When you go behind Clothier Memorial, now Tarbell Hall, you'll see this building as part of the office of the observatory. This is the original college building, which was built in 1865 to 1866. The college was started by a group of Quakers from the Baltimore Yearly Meeting, the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, and possibly some financial help from New York. It started as a boarding school for girls and boys in 1864 and 65. The first college class of six students was graduated in 1872. Dr. Edward Parrish was the first president, serving until he was succeeded by Edward H. McGill in 1871. The faculty at the time consisted of six persons. Parish Hall was destroyed by fire in 1881. During ordinary circumstances, if you have a fire in a building that size and the fire company comes and hoses it with water, the whole thing has to be torn down. However, since there was no water and there was no fire company, the only thing they could do was let it burn. The net result was that the stone walls were the only thing remaining when the fire died. When the walls cooled off, the college rebuilt the interior and kept the original walls intact. During the time that they were rebuilding, the classes of the college were held in media. The boys were at the Charter House, and the Gailey Mansion was used for girls. Graduation in 1882 was held in the restored building. These oak trees were planted in 1879 along McGill Walk, or the Asphaltum, as it was called then. This is a view of the northeast section of Swarthmore. This photograph was taken from the roof of Parish Hall around 1900 by Dr. Hoadley. He was the department head and professor of physics and engineering at the college. He was a vice president of the college from 1888 to 1914. Do you see that funny looking structure that looks like a tower? It's a water tank, and that's another Swarthmore first. These are the first houses in Swarthmore. This section was known as West Hill. The railroad station was called Westdale and was changed to Swarthmore in 1870. The Swarthmore Improvement Company was formed in 1886 to sell land. It included members of the West Hill Land Company with the important addition of Fred M. Simmons, who was to become one of the prime developers of Swarthmore. This is another view taken from the college tower and shows the original buildings on the hill. This is a close-up of the water tower. An amusing story is connected with this. When Dave Narbeth was developing this material, he talked to the Suburban Water Company, which was an outgrowth of the Springfield Water Company. They indicated that the company was formed by six professors in the physics department at Swarthmore College. But there weren't six professors in the physics department. Dave Narberth contacted Kay Bassett, and she showed him the college records that said that there were, at the time, only six teachers at the college, including the president. The building as you see it no longer exists. The water company was moved to where the short line, now SEPTA, runs from 69th Street to Media behind the Springfield Mall. There was a stream there called Whiskey Run, 
and that's where the water came from for the water company. When the tower was no longer used for the water, the tank was taken off the top and it was converted into a house. A stone plaque that says West Hill Water Company 1882 is on the porch of the house at the corner of Ogden Avenue and Walnut Lane. Believe it or not, if you go in the house today, you can see some of the supporting beams for the old water tank. This is a view looking south on Chester Road. It gives you an idea of how Swarthmore was developed south of the railroad. Swarthmore was not noted for its beautiful paved streets. Believe it or not, that's Elm Avenue as it runs into Walnut Lane. This was indicative of all streets in Swarthmore except Chester Road and Yale Avenue. They were all mud holes. There were several interesting buildings at that time. One was called the Grange. If today, Cornell Avenue and Rutgers Avenue went all the way to Michigan Avenue, the Grange property would have been between those two about a block north of Michigan Avenue. It was a summer resort in the late 1800s. People would come to spend their summer vacations, and some spent the whole summer. Eventually, the place became a speakeasy. It burned down in the late 1930s. This is a steam train coming from Media to Swarthmore in 1899. The railroad track was built in 1855, and as we noted earlier, the station at Swarthmore was originally called Westdale. In 1870, it was changed to Swarthmore because of the college. This is the original railroad station. It's been expanded, but it's still essentially the same building. The building on the right is the original post office, and the building on the left was the old freight station. These three buildings comprised the Swarthmore Station. There's a story connected with the freight station that Mrs. Bassett has told. Her father, Fred Simmons, was driving home from work in his horse-drawn carriage going north on Chester Road. There were no gates at the crossing to tell when a train was coming. His horse went across and was hit by a train and killed right before his eyes. As a result, he persuaded the powers that be to move the freight station. As we will see in later pictures, the freight station was subsequently moved to the other side of Chester Road. This is the original post office. Though it is hard to believe, Mr. McGill, the president of the college, was the first postmaster. Mr. Dolphin was the acting postmaster who actually did the work. They moved this post office building all around the village. One stop was on Park Avenue. Finally, the post office was moved into Borough Hall. This building was eventually taken over by Joe Celia, who used it as a shoe repair shop. Here is an early real estate office. It was E.C. Walton's real estate office that was adjacent to the railway station. Mr. Walton had two daughters, one who married Ed Noyes, who eventually took over the real estate business. This is the company known for many years as Noyes Real Estate and Insurance. This is the station complex. Of the two buildings in the foreground, one belonged to E.C. Walton's real estate office, and the other was a real estate office that belonged to Charlie Parker. The train station is in the middle. The train shed was on the other track. In the background is the college property. This is another one of Dr. Hoadley's pictures taken from the roof of Parish Hall, which shows how the property looked below the railroad. You can see the railroad station and where they moved the freight station. Park Avenue is the road, and we also see Borough Hall, which was built in 1885. This is another view looking down Park Avenue from near the railroad tracks. The building on the left was built by Charles Smith. He had a grocery and meat business. It was the only store of its kind in the borough for many years. Later on, there were other buildings constructed where the travel agency and the co-ed beauty salon currently are. The round building on the right is Michael's Pharmacy. This building was Boots Restaurant and Bakery, which had the post office, the general store of Hannam and Huffnell, and there was a drug store there owned by Dr. Morton and Victor Shirer. This is the same building about 20 years later. At this time, the building was taken over by Phil Durnell and his brother, who operated a hardware store. To the right of this building is the Shirer building that is still standing. Victor Shirer finally had his own drug store there. The Swarthmore Flower Shop currently occupies this. 
This is the grade crossing on Chester Road before the underpass was built in 1930, 31, and 32. You will notice the crossing guard's shack, the gates, and a policeman. Sorry. In 1927, there was a dramatic change in the borough because two men, William Clark and Mint Harvey, bought all the property where the hardware store had been. They tore down all of those buildings and put up the buildings you see. The building on the left was Mr. Smith's grocery store, which later became an American store, better known as Acme. This is the old Borough Hall that was built in 1885 and destroyed by fire in 1950. This building used to contain the Borough offices, the fire company, the library, the police station, a lunchroom, and a barber shop. The sign in front advertised an oyster and ice cream saloon. The college was started by a group of Quakers from the Baltimore Yearly Meeting, the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, and possibly some financial help from New York. As the college developed, Arthur Tomlinson, who had been a teacher, took over the Swarthmore Preparatory School and moved it to the corner of Rutgers and Harvard Avenues. All of these buildings are still standing. After a few years, Tomlinson purchased some property on Chester Road, north of Harvard Avenue, and put up those stone buildings that are there today, known as Palmer and Pittenger dorms. The prep school became quite famous. H. M. Christ and his wife started the Mary Lyon School, a school for girls. They held their first classes in the old Strathaven Inn while their buildings were being constructed. They took over some old houses on Harvard Avenue below Yale. Eventually, put up additional buildings so that in the 1920s he had quite a flourishing school. This was the Yale Avenue School built in 1891 on a triangular plot of ground bounded by Yale, Kenyon, and Rutgers Avenues. It, it was an elementary school, but in fact it was a good bit of everything, including shop and home economics classes. In 1890, the only school in Swarthmore was the Oakdale School, located on Baltimore Pike, where the PSFS is now. At, at that time, most of the children in Swarthmore lived on the north side of the tracks because there was nothing below the tracks. As the section south of the railroad developed, it became necessary to build a school. So, in 1891, the local residents appealed to Springfield Township officials for a plot to build a school, and this request was granted. The land was obtained from the Swarthmore Improvement Company, and a one-story school was planned to be built there. At the same time, people moved into newly built houses below the railroad. It became necessary for these people to have a church, since there were no churches. The church people got together and worked out an arrangement with the school, whereby the church people would contribute $2,500 to the building fund. Thus, instead of building a one-story building, they made it a two-story building with the idea that the second floor would be used for church purposes. This was how the Yale Avenue School was built and operated. In 1894, the school population had grown to the point where the school needed the whole building. The church members vacated the school and they met in the borough hall. There were also some that met at the Strathaven Inn, and others met in homes. Eventually, the church people formed the Union Evangelical Church of Swarthmore, built in 1892. There was a proviso in the charter of the Union Church, which said that in the event that any one sect or denomination would have over 50% of the members of the Union Church, two-thirds of the members would vote to turn over the Union Church facilities to the majority denomination. The others would provide for themselves. The Methodists won, but they more or less won by default. In 1895, the Presbyterians met down at the Strathaven Inn, and the Episcopalians met in homes. The Methodists became the sole owner of the Union Church. The original building has been incorporated into the larger structure that is still there on Park Avenue today. This is the original Presbyterian Church. Both the Presbyterian and the Episcopalian churches started about the same time in 1895. During the time that the Presbyterians were building their church, they met for services in the Strathaven Inn. Their church was finished in 1896 and was modeled after a church in Brittany. The church was built to seat 243 persons, even though the borough only had 100 voters. There were only 80 members of the Presbyterian church at that time. In 1903, the May Loeffler Chapel was added as a memorial. The money for it was given by the Gibbons sisters, who lived on Baltimore Pike, where the Springfield Mall is now, in memory of their ward, May Loeffler. 
This is the original Episcopal Church. Their first service was held in June 1895, and it's often referred to as the smallest church in the diocese. The present church was completed in 1932. It is on the corner of Northchester Road and College Avenue. This is the original Strathaven Inn. It was built in 1893 by Fred M. Simmons. The land on which it was built was part of the original Leaper Tract, discussed earlier in connection with the quarry. When completed, it was called the Strathaven Inn for Thomas Leaper's birthplace. It was very popular as a summer resort for Philadelphians. It was also used in the winter by Mr. Christ for his Mary Lyon School. This was a delightful place to spend the summer. There were dances on Saturday nights. They had a fine restaurant. The first movies in Swarthmore were given on the lawn. At one time there was a meeting, the outcome of which was the direct forerunner of the Keystone Automobile Club. Unfortunately, it was all wood and could not be rebuilt after a fire. It was torn down to make room for the Wildman Arms, which is now called the Strathaven Condominiums. This is a view of the old inn from the creek side. By the way, the inn was purposely burned under the direction of several fire companies. Using the logic, it was cheaper to burn it than to have it demolished. The contents had all been previously auctioned off. This odd-looking building on the right-hand side of the picture was the inn's ice house. Mr. Simmons dammed up the creek and created a lake that was used for boating, swimming, and canoeing during the summer. Then during the winter, they cut up ice out of the lake and stored it in this building. This is the Yale Avenue trolley. The location of this site is unknown. The trolley tracks went right down the middle of the road. This is another picture of the Yale Avenue trolley, which ran from Darby to Palmer's Corner. In case you don't know where Palmer's Corner is, it's the intersection of Providence Road and Rose Valley Road. This trolley went on a trestle over Crumb Creek when it got down to the end of Yale Avenue by the waterfall. The retaining wall was on Avondale Road on the right-hand side as you went up Rose Valley Road, but was taken out by the Blue Roots construction. This trolley was built in 1901 and continued for many years to media. It was replaced by a bus, and eventually the buses stopped running. Here we have the Swarthmore Fire Company. This equipment was originally housed in a barn on the corner of Elm Avenue and Chester Road. When the Borough Hall, which is in the background, was built, there was provision made for the fire company to store its equipment in the basement. This is another view of the fire company when they got more modern equipment. You'll note that the firemen wore uniforms in those days. This is Santa Claus. We have a custom in Swarthmore which is well known to almost every father, mother, and child. It was started in 1890 when William Wood Leslie began his 28 years of being Swarthmore's Santa Claus. Neighbors asked him to look in on their children on Christmas Eve, and the number of homes he visited increased each year. His original costume came from Germany. When this costume wore out, Mr. Leslie at his own expense rented a costume each year. With the help of his wife, he would make himself up as Santa Claus and start out at about 11 Christmas Eve for his all-night ride around Swarthmore for his love of the Swarthmore children. His daughter drove him for many years in a buckboard, which was low and easy to get on and off. When there was snow on the ground, the four wheels were removed and four sleigh runners were put on the axles. In his last several years, an automobile was used because the horse-drawn buckboard was too slow to visit all the homes on the list, which had grown from that time from one house to 110. Mr. Leslie felt he could no longer physically carry on, and Mr. Morris E. Smith volunteered to carry on the custom. After several years, it was too much for Mr. Smith, who then asked some young men to help him. With the help of Mrs. Elenita Jackson, the Swarthmore Santa Claus Association was formed. The borough was divided into four sections with a Santa for each section. She provided a beautiful costume for each Santa. This custom still continues today. Here we have a 4th of July parade in 1911. One of the features is the second display or float that is being hauled by oxen, which came from the Swarthmore College Farm. This parade is another custom that has continued for years. This illustrates a very interesting face of Swarthmore. As was mentioned earlier, Mr. Smith had a grocery and meat store in the village. It was the only store in Swarthmore. Men came to the homes in Swarthmore to sell fruit and vegetables. 
The fellow who went to the Norbert's house was named Billy Booth. He came every Wednesday at 9 o'clock along Chester Road with his horse and wagon, with a lantern hanging from the wagon so that the cars wouldn't hit him. Some Philadelphia food stores also sent their salesmen out to the borough weekly. At the beginning of the week, they visited their customers, took their orders, went back into Philadelphia, had the orders filled, and the orders were sent up by train out to the baggage or freight station in Swarthmore. You knew that your groceries were coming on a certain day so that you would go up to the baggage department to pick them up. Mary Donato developed a good business the same way and eventually opened a store in town. Her store went along for many years until Mary died. It was then taken over by her son and eventually he sold the business to the Martell brothers. The Martells had a fruit, vegetable and grocery store which eventually was sold and became the Great Scott store. It was located by the old college theater on South Chester Road which is now all offices. Another shopping feature hasn't been mentioned. The department stores in Philadelphia delivered purchases to homes in Swarthmore, and they had quite a system. The merchandise, whether it was furniture or a diamond ring, would be shipped out by train to the freight station. Then the stores, each one had its own wagon, would pick up merchandise from the station and deliver it to the various homes. They went from horse and wagons to trucks, and eventually they did away with the railroad end of it, and delivered it all themselves from Philadelphia. When it was still in the horse and buggy time, there was a livery stable on Dartmouth Avenue where the co-op store is now. Back of the stable was a blacksmith shop run by Frank Terrell. At his livery stable, they rented out horses and wagons and so on. You may recognize this. It is Emmons Pool. Lewis Cole Emmons and his wife Alice came to Swarthmore in 1912 and lived at the corner of Crescent Lane and Amherst Avenue while their house was being built on Riverview Road. Mr. Emmons had large holdings in the soft coal fields in western Pennsylvania and West Virginia. He bought and developed a large tract of land between Swarthmore Avenue and Riverview Road, and between the railroad and Ogden Avenue, with the exception of a few homes on Riverview and Swarthmore Avenue. Emmons, and later his real estate partner, Mr. Andes, sold building lots on Swarthmore Avenue, Ogden, Riverview, Wellesley, Woodbrook, Thayer, Guernsey, Dogwood Lane, and Forest Lane. In addition, Emmons owned a large dairy farm. The residents of that time remember the milk was so rich you could whip it. That was the Guernsey Farm, known as the Riverview Farm. Before the land was developed and houses built by Carol Thayer and Charles Fisher, a large pasture was in the front of Emmons' home. At the lower edge of this pasture near Swarthmore Avenue, Emmons dammed up a small stream and built Emmons Pool, as you see it here. This was a recreational place for his own family, and he opened it up to residents of the borough. This area of open land had a wooded area where the country week picnics were held, and the whole community participated. The idea was to bring poor women and their little children out to the country for a day in the fresh air. It was a fantastic operation, including many children of the community collecting homemade rice pudding for the picnic. The children were given free medical exams, free haircuts by Frank Maselli, the town barber, free transportation to and from Philadelphia by the Pennsylvania Railroad, as well as tours of the countryside in the autos of residents. This made a memorable day for these people, many of whom had never seen green grass or cows. This is Lewis Emmons, who came to Swarthmore from Culpeper, Virginia in 1912, and was a great factor in the development of that whole section of Swarthmore that was just mentioned. Unfortunately, in 1934, at the age of 45, he died of pneumonia. Dr. Paul Pearson was a professor of English at the college, and in 1911, he started the Swarthmore Chautauqua. For the first quarter of the 20th century, the word Chautauqua meant to rural America a week's excitement in the large tent on the village green. Swarthmore Chautauqua radiated to over a thousand towns along the eastern seaboard, from Canada down to the Carolinas. There were plays, concerts, soloists, lecturers, and they brought to thousands of people who had never seen a stage show in their lives just what a live show was like. The famous lecturers included former President William Howard Taft and Dr. Russell Conwell, who was the founder of Temple University. One of the plays, The Taming of the Shrew, had the original Broadway cast. It was a superhuman job to put on the Shakespearean play with all the costume changes, scenery changes, and all of that in a tent.
This shows the outside of the tent. This is the inside. There were a thousand chairs set up. The Chautauqua came to town for a week, and the crew included the superintendent who acted as a master or mistress of ceremonies. There were two junior leaders who taught the children, and the two tent crew boys who took care of the tent and kept it clean and orderly. These people traveled with the tent and organized the week's activities. The show, the talent, or the lecturer spent one day in each town, traveling constantly all summer long. The whole season was planned to provide serious lectures mixed with lighter entertainment, such as magicians, bell ringers, current Broadway hits, band concerts, and choral groups. Chautauqua continued until 1930, when the advent of good roads, movies that talked, and improved autos, gave the rural dweller access to large towns, radio, and later television that brought entertainment into the homes. So these new developments brought an end of a form of recreation that had enriched the lives of many. This is how the Players Club began. This was a minstrel show put on in 1911 in the Women's Club by a group of local men who wanted to raise money for the Women's Club. From 1911 until 1932, the plays were given in the Women's Club. Dr. Francis Jackson, one of the directors, was so enthusiastic that he built his house on Park Avenue near Yale Avenue. He had the dining room built so that it was the exact size of the Women's Club stage. That's where the plays were rehearsed. This is one of the plays that was put on after the Players Club was built in 1932. It was directed by Charles Seymour Sr. He's the dandy in the spats. This shows the nativity pageant which was started in 1938 by Charles D. Mitchell, a famous illustrator, his wife Reba, Helen Warren, and others. After Mr. Mitchell obtained a good script for a nativity pageant, he arranged with the college that at Christmas time the community could put on a nativity pageant in the Clothier Memorial. The townspeople took the parts and there were no spoken lines. The narration and the choral parts are performed by various religious organizations in the borough. This is another Swarthmore tradition that continues today, every other year. This is a map of early Springfield. From 1682 to the present day, Swarthmore has developed gradually from sparsely settled farmland to today's community which is noted for many positive things, including its excellent college and its reputation as a small borough with all of the attributes necessary for raising a family.